Okay, I want to welcome everybody to the first next Bible study. I love saying that, the first next. Next time it'll be the second next Bible study gathering. We've been calling it a gathering as we begin to put this together. Um, because in a lot of ways, it, it's, it's different things at the same time. It is a Bible study, and it'll grow into being more and more of a Bible study. But uh, it, it, it spawned out of several different things. And I, I, I'm not, I've had trouble getting my mind wrapped around exactly what this is because I'm not sure what it is yet. I don't know where it's going exactly, but I knew, I knew something needed to be done a long time ago. And I prayed and prayed and prayed about it. And um, in some ways, this, this gathering, uh, it, it will be irregular at times. Uh, it may get regular at times. It may have to move around to different places. There's a lot of people that said they would be able to come that didn't get to come tonight, and we're almost full here right now. Um, it is being sponsored right now by The Saving Place. And uh, anybody listening online that's in the greater Tulsa area, The Saving Place is a rustic furniture and mattress store, the deepest line of rustic Western and farm-style furniture in the state of Oklahoma. Come see us. I got I to gotta just s s sneak in a little advertisement here for, every, for Caleb and Charity. Uh, 619 East Dewey Avenue, downtown Sepulpa, Oklahoma, or check us out on the web at thesavingplace.net. Is that good? All right. Um, really, the podcast and the live broadcast is, is uh, Brother Caleb Driscoll's baby. It's something he's dreamed of for a long time, worked on for a long time, studied and figured out how to make all this happen and how it works and how to put this together. So it has a lot to do with Brother Caleb's uh, technical understanding or we wouldn't be here uh, doing what we're able to do, especially if you're listening online, you, you really owe that to Brother Caleb. And then the fact that we can do this and have this facility and change it up any way we want, sit at tables and sit at couches, get big rooms, get small rooms, go to the conference room, that has uh, everything to do with, with my wife and my children and Brother Caleb Sister Charity, um, Brandon, and Tirza specifically, because they are the saving place, and they, they work as a job, as a career, to make this facility function to produce ministry. So this is just another ministry that they produce, and I, I appreciate them very, very much. Besides uh, the podcast element and the facility element, um, there was um, several young people that came forward uh, probably as far back as two years ago, Two of them specifically pressed and pressed. One of them's here tonight, and that's my daughter, Tirza. And uh, the other one's Sister Abby, and I really, really hoped she would be here. I don't, I don't think she is. Um, but the two of them pressed and pressed and pressed, um, different adults and different ministers in the area, that, that there's questions, there's confusion. You know, they, they, they love God. They want to serve God. They believe the Bible. But there's still questions, and there's still confusion, and there's still contradictions, and there's still seeming hypocrisies. And, and there's all these sacred cows that aren't allowed to be touched, that if you talk about them, you got to talk about them secretly, uh, or you have to joke about it and sweep it under the rug and come back later and pretend like you didn't. And it's, 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 it's got to be very confusing. I mean, I, myself as a preacher of 22 years, um, I still struggle with some of this stuff. And I can't imagine being 13, 14, 15, 16, 20, 21, 22, 23 years old and just having to feel like we're just playing this game. And I don't want our young people to feel like we're playing a game. This is serious. This, every, everything we do in ministry has eternal ramifications. And, and these lives matter. We say they matter because we, in our heart of hearts, we know they matter. The elders know that the younger people matter. Each generation knows the next generation matters. But it's hard for them sometimes to believe that when only certain people produce a lifestyle that, that, that makes them feel like it matters. So that's uh, between uh, all of these different things. And um, we, we have people that are here, actually, so lots and lots of, come on in here, sister. Lots of Pentecostals, lots of free holiness people. Uh, we have some Baptists and some Nazarenes that are here. So uh, as far as that goes, um, I want you to be careful when you hear me talk, it's, it, especially at this one, but at all of them. Don't, don't hear me through your little box. 
don't hear me speak through your little filter because I'm past that box and I got rid of that filter. And so I'm speaking to the Christian nation and I'm trying to help you come along and become more a part of the Christian nation. If you hear me say a particular thing that means something secret and something special in your little church world, I, I probably am not even meaning it that way. I'm meaning it the way that everybody believes that it is defined. And, uh, you know, I, I was talking to somebody about this a few minutes ago, explaining how I was going to open this. We have a group of Nazarene people in the world that have hijacked the word Nazarene to mean their movement. The word Nazarene was a word that meant something before the Nazarene church came along. We have a group of people in, in the world that have hijacked the word baptism and, and use the word Baptist, and they feel like the word baptism and the word Baptist belongs to them. The word baptism and Baptist was here way before the Baptist movement ever came along. And it's the same thing about the word holiness. The, holy, the word holiness was, was a word for uh, a couple thousand years before the holiness movement ever came along. So I need you to hear me in a much, much broader context than what maybe you're used to hearing things. And that's why I like it here. I own this property. <laughs> I own this store. I own this company. I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And uh, I don't have to be sanctioned by any particular uh, authority or hurt or harm that particular authority by, by saying something too stern or too straight or too bold or, or too whatever um, in, in their pulpit or in their lectern or on their property or on their dime or whatever. So we, we, this, is, this, is, this is freedom here, okay? This is freedom of speech. The, the reason I'm, I'm going to appreciate, I think, these types of conversations is there's, this is one of the few religious places you'll ever be able to have these kind of conversations where nobody's claiming to be the ultimate authority. Nobody's claiming to be my way or the highway, or I'm the top dog, or I'm the one in charge, or because I say it this way, this is how it's going to happen here. That's not happening here. We're all having a conversation. And um, most of the discussion I'm going to have is going to be longer me talking this time to make some very specific points. And then starting next time, I, I hope to make my lessons smaller and smaller and more and more poignant, and, and then th have the conversation get broader and broader. Nobody's going to attack anybody. Nobody's going to be absolute right or absolute wrong. This is for a generation to learn that they can communicate. They can ask questions. They can get answers. They can, they can get facts. They can get history. They can, they can study. They can pray. They can have people that will still be their friends, still love them, still care about them, still try to get to the bottom of things with them, even if they disagree with them. So in the beginning uh, today, I chose a couple of topics uh, to teach a little bit about. And these topics are, one of them is about the most shallow possible religious topic I could ever imagine. And I picked it on purpose. I picked something extremely, ridiculously shallow. And then I picked something that is extremely, extremely doctrinal and, and very, uh, very strong throughout the church's history. And I'm, I'm going to make comparisons between them. And I don't want you to read too much into the topics themselves. I just want to show you how, how we're going to think and how we're going to study and how open this is really going to be allowed to be. Because uh, talking to some of the young people, uh, especially some of the ones from our church over the last year and a half to two years, some of the conversations, uh, some of the things that have been told to me is that um, we're always told we're going to get to have a conversation or we're going to get to ask questions or it's going to get around to this, and it never really does. It's always so constrained. So I'm going to do this tonight to let a lot of people know, people online, people here, people that are going to come in the future, just how unconstrained it really is. Um, my, my first lesson is actually called Beards and Dresses, but Not Really. Beards and dresses, but not really. I want to start by trying to wrap our minds around something. Many people that are going to come to these studies and many more that are going to be listening online are limping along and struggling with certain religious things, confused by certain teachings or non-teachings. And it's my full intention to, as much as possible and everywhere possible, make 
biblical clarifications. In some instances, this may be difficult or uncomfortable. Um, One of the primary reasons is because man hates to be wrong, especially about religion. But we're not here to decide right and wrong. We're here for the freedom to converse. What has traditionally happened over the decades and even over the centuries is that certain religious groups, in this case Christian groups, will begin to define things out of the exact character of how they are biblically presented. Normally, when we define something out of its biblical character, we overdefine it. Very, very few times in history has the church underdefined something in the scriptures. In such cases, the original defining and even more uh, and even overdefining is for right intentions. Rarely does a Christian group ever get out of context of Scripture without meaning to be right in the beginning. They at least have good reasons to start off with. Generally, to combat some evil or some worldliness that has crept into the church or the culture. But it appears that one of two things seem to end up happening. Either the teaching is put out there in a moderate way, and over time it is taken and it is applied a little stronger and a little stronger and a little stronger with each new generation that comes along until it is way out of context, or it is put out by very well-meaning but weak and sometimes even ignorant people that use their exaggerated version of a standard or a principle as pure truth because it feels safer to them and because it's easier for them to understand. But because they've taken such a narrow, unscriptural view sometimes, what happens is ultimately they greatly limit who is ever going to be able to join their church. I want you to think about that. Taking any biblical doctrine for any good and right purpose and over-exaggerating it and over-exaggerating it to the point that it is out of biblical context, what it very often does is it makes it to where less and less people could ever possibly join your church, which means it limits the exact purpose of why your church exists. So someone could have a church and want so bad for people to get saved and want so bad for the church to grow and want so bad for new converts and so bad for the lost to come in and have such over-exaggerated, unbiblical doctrines amongst all of their good and true and holy doctrines that that desire to see growth isn't happening. And a lot of times the reason it's not happening is because we refuse to be just biblical about our, our, our doctrines and our standards. This brings us down to many modern Christian semi-cultic movements Um, I use the word cultic. I know a lot of people don't like that. I I can't help it. It's a real word. And it means what it really means. And and even we, almost everybody in this room, fit that to some degree or another. Now, thank the Lord, a lot of us fit it just a little bit. And we know people that fit it a lot more. And I know people that fit it almost perfectly. I would almost have to drop the semi-cotic and just say cotic. Cotic is real. It means that if you have any practices or people that are worshipped, that's that's cotic. Any practices or people that are worshipped. Now, our practices of being Christians can't even be worshipped. Don't you think about that? You cannot be uncotic. And, and worship Christian practices. Christianity is only worshiping Christ. If you worship an attribute of Christ, like his holiness, or, or his rules, or his standard, or his, that's semi-cultic. Does it make sense? So now you see why I'm using the real definition of the real word. These, these movements end up in ways where there seems to be eventually, and I'm not, I know, again, you may be thinking about people we know. I'm talking about for about the last 1,600, 1,700 years, and I'll get to the, the historical study of it in a minute. 
there always seems to end up where there is a division between the elders that fully believe the traditions, the elders that like the traditions, and the elders that at least privately, if not openly, question the traditions. That is where most Christian movements that I minister in are at today. There's this huge division, finally, amongst the elders, those that believe very stringently the traditions, those that like the traditions, and those that at least privately, if not openly, question the traditions. When this happens, there is almost always a group within their their greater group that is splintered, hurt, broken, destroyed, and run off, and that group is the next generation. At whatever time in history that you want to look at, there's always a next generation. That generation is subsequently split between those that leave and those that stay. Those that leave may leave because they were hurt or because they were carnal or because they were backslid or because they were not saved or because they couldn't figure out how to negotiate the minefield surrounding the church of what is truth and what is commanded and what is tradition and what is hypocrisy. There is a percentage of each generation that leaves each Christian movement because they get weary of trying to know what to believe that's biblical and what I'm supposed to believe that's not really biblical and what we just kind of go along with, even though it is kind of biblical, but not the way we do it. And then the stuff that just is nothing. And they just get tired of it. Now, do we have people that leave for other reasons? Of course. And I listed a bunch of them. We may not be able to do as much about those as we can about those that leave because they get tired of trying to negotiate the minefield surrounding the church of what is truth, what is commanded, what is tradition, and what is hypocrisy. Then you have those that stay, that will eventually make up the established church if they stay long enough. In that group, you have another split of those that stay. You have the purists and the non-purists. The purists believe exactly or nearly exactly or at least much more closely than their counterparts, the traditions that were passed down to them from the last generation. The purists are always the smallest of all the groups. The group that stays on from the last generation that believes it exactly the way the, the last generation did is always your smallest group. The non-purists do not believe to one degree or another as much as the purists, but they stay for many reasons. Because it's better than their other options. Because it's where their family is because it's more comfortable than the alternatives or because they like enough of the teachings and traditions that they can overlook the rest. Once again, if they stay because they like enough of the teachings and traditions that they can overlook the rest, if you're willing to attend a church that you're willing to overlook certain flaws in their doctrines, then you are extremely limited as to who you are going to be able to convert. You will only be able to fully convert other people that will also be willing to overlook the exact same flaws in the exact same doctrines that you already do. And that's a very tall order. Think of all the lost people you know. And you're going to narrow it down to trying to win the ones that can believe exactly what you believe and, and overlook or pretend to not see all the things that you don't believe. The same. Has to be that it can't be some or the the same. It doesn't mean they can't get saved if they don't overlook the things you're willing to overlook, but it means they're probably never going to be a part of your church. Which practices are biblical commands? Which ones are Christian cultural? Which ones are personal or optional or regional or denominational or interpretive? Y'all catch all that? You know, there's regional. Which ones are innocent? Which ones are destructive? Why? And what do we do about them, if anything? Do we, do we hurt more people and do more damage by trying to touch the sacred cows? That's possible. I want y'all to understand that. Some sacred cows are so ingrained in certain church organizations, and they're so wrong, they're so unbiblical, and they're so false but they're so ingrained in certain groups of people that if you're going to take that cow down, you're going to kill a lot of people. Those things have to be considered. 
This is what we're trying to deal with here at Next. The biggest problem with these, I call them enhanced doctrines, that are biblical principles plus traditions, is that when the next generation figures out that there are unbiblical traditions being taught, they have a tendency to act like the youth that they really are. Crazy, huh? Kids act like kids. I had a guy ask me here a while back. He said, we got, we got these drug addicts, man, and they're always lying to us and messing with us and stealing from us. He said, well, I don't know what to do with them. He said, does that ever happen to you? And I said, what? Has a sinner ever sinned in my presence around me? Yeah. Yeah, sinners act like sinners. Kids act like kids. When each generation comes along, this, this word keeps getting thrown out. Rebellious, rebellious, rebellious. I hear that word all the time. That, I, I think that's a mistake. I really do. Every time a teenager does something teenagerly, teenager-like, unfully adult-like, to call them a rebel, it, it, it's, it's going to do way more damage than it is good. These young people, like any other age, have strengths and weaknesses. Some of each new generation's strengths are their, uh, their daringness, their, their energy, all of these things. But, but these principles plus traditions actually play right into each young people's group of weaknesses. The youth have a natural tendency to be more rebellious than any other age group. And often they have a natural tendency to be more irrational in their thought process than any other age group. So when discovering that they have been taught unpure truths, they have a tendency to fulfill the old adage of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. How many preachers have you ever heard try to fix a broken doctrine by begging their congregation to don't throw out the baby with the bathwater? We do it all the time. My pastor does it all the time. I do it all the time. In in other words, the the generations before try to enhance, try to strengthen a particular biblical principle. I want you to catch that. That's what we do a lot as Christians. We try to strengthen or enhance or, or build up around a biblical principle. Does that bother anybody? Does that mean that biblical principle was too weak to stand on its own? Is that what that means? So the generations before tend to enhance, try to strengthen a particular biblical principle by adding to it and tightening it up for the protection of the principle. They're trying to protect the biblical truth. That's how we get to some of the things that we have going on that are are too much, too far, too flawed. It's because people were trying to protect the biblical truth. You have to at least come at it with that understanding. Then the next generation comes along and realizes that the enhanced parts that the last generation emphasized most, not necessarily biblical, so they attempt to cast them aside. Oftentimes, casting aside the very doctrine. Generations will come along and see flaws in the building up process. And in the process of trying to cast that aside, they'll cast aside the very biblical doctrine that the elders were attempting to strengthen to begin with. So the exact opposite of what was tried to be accomplished happens. In my opinion, the majority of the blame for the next generation casting away a true biblical doctrine often falls on the heads and on the hands of the previous generation that altered the doctrine to begin with instead of teaching it in its purity. The problem with this is that the extra additions to and enhancements of do not stand alone. The enhancements and the strengthenings of doctrines do not stand alone without the doctrines. They're only specifically there for to prop up, if you will, the doctrine. They're not principles themselves. They stemmed from, they were attached to real Bible principles. Thus, 
creating this very messy situation where some young people throw the whole principle away because of the hypocrisies and false teachings within it. And in these Bible studies and in the next generation, I want to deal with this, this, this losing of sound doctrines in the process it makes the church weaker. It makes the church worldlier, ultimately doing the exact opposite of what the last generation intended. So in the same vein of thought, oftentimes the previous generations will fear monger. They will threaten, if you will, the next generation by, quote, admonishing them that to discard the tradition is equal to discarding the biblical principle that, is it is, that it's attached to. Because oftentimes in Christian ranks, the tradition has been taught as the doctrine and the doctrine has become the tradition. They're literally seen as one and the same because the doctrine itself is no longer even taught. The tradition is taught in its place to the point that the doctrine is not known or understood by the next generation. They don't know the real biblical doctrine. They just know the traditions that are in place to strengthen the doctrine. So basically my generation would tell some of you younger people's generation, don't worry about understanding the Bible. Don't worry about understanding the scriptures. Don't under worry about grasping the true biblical doctrine. You just follow these extracurricular rules that we've created around the doctrine and you can't possibly mess up the doctrine. Which is supposed to be in your favor, but how could it be in your favor to not know the Bible? I I'm, I'm here this evening to try to help sort out some things if I can. I'm fine with you questioning traditions. I have no problem with that. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I have a problem with you deciding to discard certain additions. But first, we've got to decide what the actual biblical principle is and sacredly guard and protect it throughout the entire process. You cannot safely question traditions until you secure doctrines. The problems that I've seen and that I'm worried about and I'm scared about and the problems that my pastor's seen and I know he's scared about and he's worried about is we've seen generations question. We've seen generations question the standards that were added to by man. And in the process of moving and going past those, they, went, they blew right past the doctrinal principles. You cannot question the traditions without first securing the biblical principles. When questioning traditions, the biggest mistake that one can make is not knowing, understanding, and protecting the original Bible principle first and foremost. Let me uh, attempt to walk us through a couple of them. These are very, very simple. One of them means the beard thing. It means almost nothing to me. I could absolutely care less. The dress thing is much more important to me. Um, and, and it's much more biblical and doctrinal. But, but I picked these because they're so simple. I know, I know people will get online and I'll get in trouble because they're controversial. But regardless of how controversial they are, uh, one of them's almost ignorant, and, and the other one is, is so basic, I don't know how you could get it wrong. But let's look at these. Um, I'm just using them because they're simple to get information on because everybody can understand them. Let's look at the facial hair or the beard um, first. People sitting in this room, 90% of the people in this room probably feel like that facial hair is a, is a holiness movement issue more than anything else. And, and the devil may use that to really torment you about your church or your elders or your doctrines, but that is absolutely the farthest thing from the truth. The beard has been a point of contention off and on throughout the entire history of the church. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the holiness movement ever existed, the, the Christian clergy has swung back and forth, back and forth between pro-facial and anti-facial hair throughout all of its existence. Even right now, I'm going to show you something that probably at least 90% in this room, this is going to be a big eye opener for you. I'm going to read you the titles of some books and some articles and some websites that I've read in the last 10 years, just since 2009, okay? The War of Christian Beards, an article from Christian Forum magazine. Off with the Beard by Baptist Christian Forum. 
what the Bible says about facial hair by revelation.com. And my favorite one, I don't like Pentecostal men with facial hair, holiness blog address periodical. Uh, another one here. Does the mother church need a view on shaving beards or not? A booklet by the Catholic Catechism Worldwide. Now, I'm going to show you something that I, I'm, I'm just going to assume you probably didn't know. The beard is a point of contention in the last 10 years to the charismatics, to the Catholics, to Christian church worldwide, to holiness Pentecostals. Uh, what was the other one? Anyway, there's at least four of them. There's five of them total. I'm missing one. Anyway, five completely different denominational looks at it. And they're all having the exact same internal debate that we think we're the only ones that ever had. The Catholic Church has a booklet out on it. Did you know this? Anybody? The Catholic Church has a booklet called Does the Mother Church Need a View on Shaving Beards or Not? Now, I'm going to give you just a scratch on the surface of the way the pendulum has swung over just a few years window in the church's history on this one issue. You're more likely to see a beard in the pulpit today than any other time since the 1800s, but beards, especially among clergy, were once very serious religious symbolic matters. The beard is what separated the East from the West during the great church schism. The priests from the laity during the Middle Ages. The Protestants from the Catholics during the Reformation. Some church leaders required them, others banned them. To medieval theologians, they represented both holiness and sin. But historian Giles Constable says that rules on beards sound more forceful than they ever really were. Clergy, especially powerful ones, were likely to follow fashion in their day than conviction to wear a beard was usually considered a sign of rebellion. Watch this. To wear a beard was considered a sign of rebellion for about 50 to 75 years at a time. And then to not wear a beard as a Christian would be considered a sign of rebellion for about the same period of time. And it swung back and forth, back and forth, back and forth dozens of times. So we're probably towards the end of a period of time where it was considered rebellion. And probably some of you here alive in this room will be alive when shaving it is considered a sign of rebellion. If history repeats itself, and it has dozens of times already. Also, if you go back and you look, just, just for the cause of it, because I'm right here. Uh, when the East was separated from the West during the great church schisms, when the priest and the laity were separated in the Middle Ages, when the Protestants and the Catholics were separated during the Great Reformation, the Pentecostal people and our doctrine, if you, if you follow the side, there was two sides, two sides, two sides, two sides. If you go back and you follow our doctrine and you, you see which side we would have been on, we would have been Protestants and not Catholics. We would have, you see what I'm saying? Uh, if you follow our side, our side was always pro-facial hair side until just all of a sudden hear about these last 80 years again. And again, it's about that period of time when it swings around. Um, in, in 195, in 195 uh, AD, Clement of Alexandria calls the beard, uh, this was 200 years after Christ's death, Clement of Alexandria calls the beard the mark of a man and says it is therefore unholy to desecrate the symbol of manhood. Many other church fathers made similar remarks about beards and manliness, but most early church clergy were either beardless or had a closely trimmed beard. 361 AD, Roman Emperor Julian sports a beard to show his break from the shaven Christian emperors before him and to mark his connection to pagan Roman religion. 411 A.D., Euthyma says only men with beards can enter his Judean desert monastery, not boys with female faces. 475 A.D., a rule is made that no cleric should grow long hair or shave his beard. That's probably the most biblical thing in there, that there was a rule made that if you were a man and you were going to be a minister, you had to have short hair and a beard. It's very out of step with its time. Several copyists simply change it to no cleric should grow long hair or a long beard. It seems to have been ignored in its day, but 
uh, became widely referenced in the 1100s and 1200s. By 816 AD, the Council of Aachen required monks to shave every 15 days, 24 times a year. Other monastic communities adopt similar rules, though some only require a shave six or seven times a year. So you see that everything that we have heard in our lifetime on this subject has come and gone dozens of times in the church. The reason I'm putting this in here is not to argue one side or the other. I literally could care less. I put it in here because I refuse to waste much time dealing with something that has zero eternal ramifications. When we're murdering babies, when we're marrying women to women, when we got all these things we claim to be so up in arms about and take so seriously, and then there's a topic that continually, continually, continually comes up in our midst that has no biblical reference whatsoever. Somebody's wrong. Somebody's way off. They're, they're wasting time. They're blowing hot air. It means nothing. I know. I know y'all are looking at me. I will, I'll get attacked for this. I, I, I get it. I understand. But what I'm saying is, when they try to stand on something, the way they stand on it, they say, oh yeah, well in 195 AD and in 411 AD and this one was rebellious and this one was paganistic, that's right. What they're doing is they're hitting every other trend in history. Because I could come back and, and skip up one and then hit every other trend in history and, and my facts would be the exact opposite of theirs. It's a waste of time. This is the type of way we're going to give you information and have conversations. I'm not, I'm not interested in picking fights or, or, or proving one person wrong or the other, but there's plenty of facts, plenty of history, and there are some things that when you ask the questions, we're going to come to the conclusion that they mean nothing. And then we can all be glad that it's over and it means nothing. We won't worry about it no more. And anybody that makes a big deal out of it, that's their problem. Okay. Now, let's look at the other one because it's totally different. Let's look at the dress. Same approach. Here's a few fairly uh, current articles and books that were written within the last 10 years, since, since uh, 2009. Should Christian women today wear pants? An article from Beyond Today Christian Magazine, a subsidiary of Charisma Television. Christian women should dress with a dress from Revelation.com. Are pants trousers? And if so, can we make a correlation between them and Deuteronomy 22 and 5 by the Nazarene Church International? If That's just a few of them. If we were to take the time, we would find that Christian modesty on women in different places at different times meant different garments, robes, long shorts, pants, long dresses. Nobody in this room doesn't know that, right? We all know that. But did you know? that right now, currently, the Nazarene Church International is trying to figure out if their women should be wearing dresses or not. Did you know that it is a, is a huge split in the charismatic movement in England and in Great Britain over trying to enforce women wearing dresses or not? That's what these articles actually are talking about. I've read all these articles. My conclusion... We, I, I could talk about that for hours, but I'm not. My conclusion would be, I just want you to see this, that, that along the way, Christian groups have overplayed their hand on certain things as beards and dresses. But herein lies the problem. Are we going to defend what we like? Are we going to defend what we were taught? Are we going to defend what we've believed? Or are we going to figure out what the Bible says and teach it and defend that? Don't, don't draw any conclusions on dresses yet. I know some of you just got nervous. Stay with me. With all that I know of Scripture, if I, if I had nothing but the Bible, nothing, if I didn't know anybody, if I had never read anything else, if I would never listened to anything, if all I had was the Bible, I would say that the purest gospel right now in 2018 to be preached would be that men should grow beards and women should wear dresses. That's what I would believe if I didn't know everything that I've been taught. But I'm not sure where that would lead to if I just started preaching that. 
But if all I had was the Bible, that's what I would, that's the conclusion I would come to is my wife should wear a dress and I should have a beard. I'm having a conversation with you because I don't want you to just obey. And I'm talking more to the youth right now. I'm not, I'm not talking down to people my age, but I, I don't want you to just obey. I want you to think and pray and decide what you believe and be comfortable with what you believe. And I want you to know what you believe and why you believe it. Because doing what I or anyone else tells you to do will not be enough to get you to heaven. And it surely won't be enough for you to help anybody else get to heaven. The truth is, the Bible has almost zero input on facial hair, period, period. If it leans one way or another, it has a 0.01% pro beard stance. If anyone tries to stretch it out to say or mean more than that, they're making a huge mistake, in my opinion. It causes confusion because most doctrines that get off course get off course in the opposite directions, and I'll show you what I mean. Lots of people that I know, lots of people listening to these, lots of people watching this, lots of people in this room have heard, young man, don't wear a pink shirt. It makes you look like a sissy. Now shave your face. Excuse me? And we're going to be mad at them for being confused? Only a man can grow a beard. By design. By creation. God did that. Don't be pointing at women with a mustache or anything. <laughs> God did that. So, so really our doctrine is masculine men and feminine women. Right? Trying to stay in touch with Scripture and God's creation, we, we masculine men, feminine women. So it makes perfect sense if you think that the way to do that is to tell your young men not to wear pink shirts. I, I think that's goofy too, but I mean it would make sense until you tell them to shave. Now you've, now you've just made mass confusion. It's an oxymoron. We, we have this biblical principle. And the biblical principle is, in Genesis chapter 2, God created the male and female. And every single book in the entire Bible, all the way from Genesis to Revelation, has scripture after scripture after scripture referencing God promoting separation of the sexes. He gives one a certain uh, style of authority and one a completely different style of authority. He puts one in a certain place and he gives another one a certain uh, other place. He tells one, don't wear the kind of clothes like that one. And that one, don't wear the kind of clothes like that one. He tells that one, you have to have hair like this. And this one, your hair is to be totally different like that. Every, book after book after book after book, God is emphasizing the separation of the sexes. So that makes us look pretty good with these dress things. but then we'll just go off and make something just as powerful and just as important to us that goes in the very opposite direction. I'm trying to, you see what I'm saying? Again, I told you I could, I could care less, but at least we ought to be honest if we're going to go back to the scriptures. If I would interject my opinion right here, and I will, because uh, somebody might ask me, I always shave. I shave every day for several reasons. I cannot hardly grow a beard, and it was very embarrassing as a young man. <laughs> Number two, it itches like crazy, and I hate that. Number three, I think I look terrible with it. And number four, I am much more accepted to preach in many other denominations and venues without one, and I want to reach as many souls as possible. Those are the only, I emphasize the only reasons why I shave. Now, you may have missed something I just said. I said I'm much more accepted to preach in many other denominations. And that's true. I preach for lots of denominations. Some of them you probably never even heard of. And some of them, they wouldn't preach me if I was wearing a beard. So it's just easier for me if I'm going to get to reach as many souls as I possibly can to do that. To doctrinalize it is to take it one step further than, than God ever said anything about it. The one thing you will not hear me say as a church leader, 
you will never hear me say, Lord, help me. There is nothing wrong with them necessarily, and I don't particularly care if you wear one or not, but I don't wear one, and you're never going to catch me with one. That is a terrible way to present a gospel clarification. I finally come to the point that I'm letting my guard down a little bit, and I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a throw the dog a bone and say it's okay. We all know it's okay. But bless God, I ain't never going to have one. What, what does that mean? I'm backing down from the tradition a bit. I'm not going to condemn you per se any longer, but if you were as holy as I was, you would live everything the Bible teaches plus this extra stuff too. But if you can't do it, I'm going to try to understand because I know it's not really... What, what does that mean? What kind, of, what kind of message does that send this next generation? It's, it's a horrible excuse for leadership, but, but many are trying it so that they can straddle the fence and try to please the elders and pacify the youth at the same time. They're trying to lead multiple levels of indoctrination instead of just the Bible. And they generally will hurt more than they help. When we pick what we believe, some will follow. The longer we're wishy-washy and back and forth and straddle the fence, eventually nobody will follow. The Bible is also quite plain about men and women not wearing each other's style of garment. That much we got. It's one of the few things in Scripture that there's almost no possible way to take it except currently and culturally. The difference in clothing styles by, by the two sexes is one of the very few things in the whole Bible that you're allowed to take at its face value in your current climate and your current culture. Now, most things, when I see people taking them out of Scripture and trying to make them apply to just their current culture, it, it's a disaster because the Bible is so universal. But, but this plays to the fact that this almost has to be currently and culturally because clothes wear out so quickly, trends change so quickly. Historically, clothing is mass produced by region. We cannot all wear his and her Greek robes because we can't get a hold of his and her Greek robes. Um, we can't all wear samurai or geisha garb because we couldn't all get enough of them. God expects there to be enough Christians for the Christians to affect society enough that the market will produce enough male and female clothing that we can still dress separately. As the Christian population has decreased in the Western countries such as the United States, Canada, Great Britain, and Australia, the clothing market has become more and more unisex. The church is all the time blaming that on the world. It's definitely not God's fault. And I see the problem with the world, but in a lot of times it's the church's fault because the church is not producing enough saints to put enough pressure on the market to create non-unisex clothing. And the reason we can't is because we got all these goofy doctrines that we can't explain. <laughs> so as we try to strengthen the doctrines by building up around them and making them tighter and tighter and tighter, we create an environment where less and less people will ever possibly be converted to our faith, which means more and more people are out there in the world, which means the world can change the clothing styles to where our women look like prostitutes and our men look like homosexuals and all of that because we did that. We did that by not sticking to the Bible. So people have to decide to either submit to unbiblical practices to be a part of a good church or don't join that church. What a horrible choice. What a terrible choice we're giving the community around us if we're making them decide to submit to unbiblical practices to be a part of a good church or just don't join the church. That's disgusting to think that we know people that that's the option we give them. Here are two basic, simple, shallow teachings, facial hair and dresses, that easily create this great distraction, the mass confusion, this feeling of hypocrisy in each next generation. Many groups split them. They may take a stand against facial hair and then turn right around and be completely dogmatic about women wearing dresses. When all along the Bible doctrine in Genesis chapter 2, creation of two-sex society, which is very structured throughout all of Scripture, 
And if it was studied and prayed over and preached and taught correctly, it would probably look something like this, okay? It would never bring up facial hair, ever. It would demand exacted distinctions between how men dress and how women dress. And depending on what part of the world you lived in, it would teach separately from the doctrine a Christian social acceptance of traditional modest male and female garb. In America, it would be trousers on men and dresses on women. You would have no choice. This teaching would leave less room for confusion. It would have less hypocrisies and less inconsistencies. And most importantly, we would actually be combating and fighting directly against the LGBT movements and the feminist liberation movements and the just shack up movements and the cheap and easy divorce movements. Listen, those people could care less if we waste our time on beards and mustaches and trying to get the right kind of dress on a jungle tribal person or not. But I guarantee you those people, because I've, I've learned from experience, they care a whole lot if you're teaching separation of the sexes, purity, modesty, the deified Christ. What a biblical church does is preach repentance, salvation, purity of thought, word, and deed, modesty, the depth and accuracy of the truest biblical doctrine, such as two-sex society, the fact that God is a pro-marriage, anti-divorce God, the, the created and established difference between men and women, God's sovereignty, the existence of free moral agency. The struggles of good versus evil and right versus wrong and perversions versus purities are not being bothered whatsoever by a discussion of beards, goatees, sideburns, uh, how big and what kind of, if, uh, if any, of a wedding band you're allowed to wear. But the tools and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? Second Corinthians 10 and 4, right? We love to quote that verse, but then we hear preaching and teaching all the time about dresses and rings and sideburns and hairstyles, and and that's carnal. We quote that our weapons are not carnal, and then we try to fight with carnal, tangible, material things instead of spiritual things. I would that we could teach the next generation to fight with their prayers and fight with their purity and fight with their consecration instead of their sleeves and their skirts and their guitars. The things that we always put our emphasis on. You, some people would say we, we don't put our emphasis. Yes, we do. Just go to some church services with that in mind. What is the emphasis on? Traditions, music, how the atmosphere feels. What, what kind of, what look we've created. That's what our emphasis is on often. It's not scaring the devil. Who sings better than who, or who plays better than who, or, or who's smoother than who, or who's more polished than who, or that, that doesn't scare the devil at all. You start teaching these solid biblical doctrines and preaching on them and not making excuses for why we still do this and why we still do that and try to keep the little click together. And the devil will know that we're on his territory. I listed a few things off the top of my head that I consider the greatest evils of modern time. Abortion, sodomy, divorce, heroin, meth, those other things that I just listed a moment ago, repentance, salvation, purity in thought, word and deed, modesty, two-sex society by design, a pro-marriage, anti-divorce, God, God's sovereignty, free moral agency. These things combat abortion. These things combat sodomy. They combat divorce. They combat heroin. They combat meth. So are we going to continue to fight with paper swords? Or are we going to take up steel ones that God provided for us? Are we going to continue to fight with bulletless guns or are we going to load those guns? If the one, then the Western Christian movement as a whole will continue to lose. If the other, we can make a difference. We have bullets. The wholesome look of 1 Thessalonians 5 and 22, the gender distinctions of Deuteronomy 22 and 5, the modesty of 1 Timothy 2 and 9, we have bullets. But our next group of soldiers have been around long enough to have been in multiple battles in their lives already, and yet we still haven't issued them these bullets. How do I know? Well, just 
just for the group of 50 or 60 people, whoever's here right now, let me ask you questions. Two, two quick questions here. When was the last time you heard a sermon lesson on gender distinction or the creation principles or a two-sex society or what the Bible specifically teaches about addictions? When is the last time you heard a sermon that was based on something that you consider one of the greatest battles of your lifetime? Now, let me ask you this question. When was the last time you heard neckties, sleeve links, football come up from the pulpit? That's a lot easier to remember sometimes. Not because our pulpits are necessarily wrong. It's because there's such a disconnect between the teaching and the lives of the people. The ministers I know, my, my pastor, my assistant pastor, Brother, uh, brother, brother James Burgess, um, the, the, the pastors of the HMA churches, uh, ministers that are right here in this room, Brother Caleb and Brother Jordan and uh, Brother Sean and Brother Connor and uh, looking around here, I don't want to miss nobody, but uh, Brother Robbie, Brother Robbie Reed, the, we mention some of these things way more often than we mention the things probably necessary to mention because we're all in the same boat together at the same time where there's this, 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 this mass confusion that's coming to a head from a generation that is the most intellectualized generation. This generation has more information than any generation that ever lived in the history of the world. And that's all coming together. And, and everybody's trying, I believe, their best to, to combat evil. But we've got to come together collectively, generation by generation by generation, and, and recognize that the best way to combat evil is with pure truth. Go back to the core of the sin or go back to the core of the doctrine to go back to the core of the principle and, and preach that and teach that and explain that and have a conversation about that. This is the reason for the style and the approach that I want to take here. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking way more time this time than I hope to most all other times. What we cannot do is so muddy the waters of doctrines with traditions that as each next generation discovers another tradition that they deem to be a false doctrine and discard it, that we have so attached the tradition to the doctrine that as they discard the tradition, they discard the doctrine as well. This is a great trick of the devil played on all of us. If this generation wants to help keep the next generation from losing some sound doctrine and Bible truths, then we have to stop attacking tra attaching traditions to doctrines. And for the sake of eternity, we have got to start using our pulpits again to teach and preach biblical commands, doctrines, oracles, laws, precepts, principles, and truths without mingling them with traditions. We can explain traditions. We can teach the significance of traditions, but we cannot enforce them without making another new mess. Growing up, a lot of us have heard preaching that was heavy on tradition and light on doctrine. Most people in this room would agree with that. Most of us have heard lots of preaching heavy on tradition, light on doctrine. Thank God we are now at a place where we are hearing more doctrine, yet still mingled with tradition. We have to be the ones that are courageous enough to push on through to where we're preaching, teaching, and demanding to be preached and demanding to be taught pure doctrines. This is not a lesson on beards or dresses. This is not a challenge necessarily to traditions. This is a call back to pure doctrines. I see a lot of great men out there that are, that are trying to do this. One problem I see come up over and over again is the way that they're trying to do it is, is to bring up the tradition and point it back to the doctrine to reconnect it to the doctrine. Thus, their sermons are still based on traditions, and sometimes it's a stretch to connect them back to the doctrine. They feel a little better because they finally got the doctrine in there. But why not just preach a sermon on the biblical doctrine and see what, if any, traditions that it might lead to, whether named by you out loud, or by the Holy Ghost in private. 